This is a completely utterly non-technical talk. Just get that right out there now. This is literally the take a break from the, the technical. And I wanted to talk about my company, not on the high street. I will be promoting it throughout because we are hiring. So please spread the word. And try and figure out why my company is like the Milky Way. So this is my background. I am an astrophysicist. I converted to data science about a year ago. Um, I was used to banks of computers, huge telescopes, traveling around the world. Also outreach, which will come in later as well as a kind of a key factor. And then I moved to data science. So I did a course, uh, the Pivago course, science to data science, and moved to data science. And now this is my life. I get one computer, haven't quite moved to like Hadoop, Spark and things, we're still doing it basic. And I look at the website. I try and figure out how things fit on the website, all this sort of stuff. And my favorite item ever on our website. Yes, that is a plastic pigeon with a lamp in its bum. <laughs> no idea, not a clue. It's brilliant, no point to it whatsoever. But my job is often trying to relate things like this to a 10,000 pound necklace. There is no correlation. My job is to figure out what that correlation could be and how we can convince somebody who would like a 10,000 pound necklace that this is brilliant. Or what person would actually like this. So my talk is on SMEs. No. This is what I know of an SME, a solar mass ejection. When people started talking to me about SMEs, I'm like, so it's a catastrophic event that could wipe out all life on the planet. That's a business model? So no, an SME is an actual type of company. And these companies are small to medium sized enterprises. And they're usually independent. Depends on the country, but they usually have under 250 employees. And there's a very good reason I want to talk about these, because no one ever does. So when I was moving to data science, we were asked, what sort of company do you want to work for? A startup or a big established company? Both, you know, legit options. I have friends who work in large established companies where they're going into a data science team where all of this is set up for them and ready. I have others who are little tiny companies of 12 people. But what about everything else in the middle? And there is a big range of those. SMEs are growing. There's uh, 5.5 million in the middle of the beginning of 2016. And these have grown by 2 million since 2000. These companies are increasing. The opportunities to work in them are increasing. And the opportunities to work in them are also so incredibly varied that it's good. And the employment's increasing. These make up at least 99% of every main industry sector. And yet when people move from data, from academia or any other job to data science, these tend to be ignored. So I wanted to explain you know, what are the good things and bad things about these sort of companies. And they also put a lot into the economy. The odds of actually going into one of these companies are high and they produce 66% of all private sector employment. So the real point of this talk, Disclaimer, these are my opinions. I would love Sorry. any <laughs> I would love uh, any discussion. Um, please ask questions now, later, put my email address up, or even while I'm talking, if you have any opinions you think might be valid. Brief intermission, but I will keep talking. Um, there's also generalizations in here. When I say big data science big companies, they don't necessarily have a data science um, section. You might be actually going into a big company as kind of like a startup in terms of data science. But I'm going to generalize the above. My company is a, um, is a, a medium sized company. We've been around for 11 years now. Um, we are a marketplace. So we have our own little quirks. We have about 5,000 partners. These partners all sell on our website. Each of these partners has a different opinion of what they should be doing. So we're dealing with our partners as stakeholders. We also have everybody else in the company. We're a self-contained company. So we have marketing, we have commercial, we have tech. So you also have to deal with all these other individual people who all want the same thing, but don't necessarily want it to do it in the same way. So what did I take from academia 
and take into data science, and more specifically into my company. Great lesson from academia. You're used to working with lots of different people. I had collaborations all the way around the world, and as the little disclaimer says, often these people will have their own thoughts as to where your work should go. Exactly the same in my company at this point. They'll all have maybe the same sort of question, but have completely different ideas as to where it should go. Marketing want one thing, commercial want another. In data, we're trying to say you do know none of those are actually viable in the timescales you're giving us. So it's that collaboration. Also, the compromise, but not compromising your integrity and your data. In small companies, you might not actually have this as an option. You're in a company of, say, 10, 12 people. Within that company, you might not have that conflict. And my friends in larger companies say they don't, particularly in junior level, obviously this changes as you go out, uh, get to more senior levels, but in junior levels, you don't have that real conflict. You're collaborating with lots of people, but they don't necessarily have different ideas to you. You're all working on the same project in the same direction. I found in academia, my collaborators didn't always want my research to go in that direction. They wanted it to go in their own direction because that helped theirs. So it's that compromise between figuring out what you can do and how to make everybody else happy. Perfect example from academia, and I use it every day in my company. Another good lesson. If you've been in academia, you've probably been encouraged to do outreach. Probably unwillingly, and you did it because you thought you had to. But this is an incredible skill doing outreach. I actually spent Thursday evening teaching people in my company from customer services and commercial how to do SQL. Slightly painful, but I fed them cocktails at the same time. It was great fun. And those skills you learn from outreach, being able to talk to anybody about any subject. You know, teaching five-year-old astronomy, you don't start with convex lenses and galaxy redshift. You start with, oh, look, look where this light has come from. And it is exactly the same talking to stakeholders. I found start basic, assume they know nothing of what you're talking about, get the level first, and then move on. The same as you do in outreach. In a startup, again, there's probably a small number of you. You're probably on the same level. You don't have as many stakeholders to deal with. Different if you're in consulting, you will have that level again when you're doing consulting. In a large company, my friend, she talks to her boss. Her boss knows exactly what she's doing. She doesn't have to deal with stakeholders. That's what her boss does. In, in my company, I'm the one getting the emails from my stakeholders saying, where is it? What's going on? Can you please explain what's happening? Can you please explain why you need to do all this engineering to do it? You know, what is an algorithm? It's one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> you get those. And you, just, you don't ignore them, but you politely say, do you really want to know? Here's the math. Take the math away and explain. And so they appreciate what you're doing, but you have to do this. You have to talk to your stakeholders. You have to manage your expectations. Because if they don't know what's going on, they're not going to use your data. And they're not going to use your data in the way that you hope they use your data, which is also a very key point. In my research, I was in the driving seat. I led my research, led it through, and yep, that was it. And that's great, because you then know how to basically be a stakeholder yourself in some ways. In small companies, everybody knows what you're doing. You have your, your area. You go through it. There's no real conflict as to whether you're the driver or not. <coughs> Large companies, my friend isn't the driver. She's told what to do. Go do. I find I have to be the driver, but I also have to fight to be the driver sometimes. I will be told we need to do this project. But I won't necessarily be told all the details of this project. I will be told that this person is very interested. They want to be the driver as well. But I know the data. So working with them, they can be a co-pilot. They can just sit to the side for a bit. And if it comes to it, they can do this. In academia, I had to fight for some of my research. Because other people thought, oh, that is a nice project. I want to do that. Please, can I take over? And you have to be careful. I found this skill very useful. In academia, if you don't go into work, people might notice. People not, might not. You're kind of expected to, to deal with your own time management. I've also found the same. If I don't deal with my time management properly and the job doesn't get done, it's not as bad in academia. Someone says, it's fine. My job, yeah, doesn't go so well. So those are the good lessons. 
those are things I've brought in from academia and thought, I'm really glad I actually learned that. Also picked up some bad habits. Deadlines are real. They really are, and they're urgent. Usually, they're closer than you think. Often, I wanted it yesterday. Great, thank you. Much appreciate that thought. In academia, depends on who you are. Deadlines are usually, there's a grant in two months time. Most academics will start the work a week beforehand, so you, you're used to tight deadlines. Um, I've been up so many nights because my supervisors said, oh, there's a grant deadline, can you do all this work? It's like, it's two months of work, it's in five days. But deadlines are real, you have to stick to them. Otherwise, people lose faith in what you're doing. And to be fair, this is actually across all data science. I know in big companies, my friend um, who I've been talking to about this, she doesn't necessarily have that urgency of deadline. Her boss deals with that. If she misses a deadline, it's on his head. Obviously, that's not a good thing to do, but I'm the one they come to if it goes out of date, if the data they've got doesn't appear where they said it would appear at that point. Um, and potentially in small companies, you have a bit more flexibility with those deadlines. They're not as urgent. They're not coming from a, a different area. Now, that may or may not be true. But this is definitely one of the things I found most hard. Deadlines are there. They're set. You know, you have to give the, the, the board their data by this point or that board meeting's not happening and you've just wasted 20 people's time. You don't have control over your data. In certainly astrophysics, they're very, very secretive about their data. It might, when they publish it, go in the paper and you have access to it. I found reproducibility was not a real thing in astrophysics. You kind of might be able to do it, but they want to keep their secrets. In my company, that you, you don't get to keep your data and your secrets. In fact, you're asked to share. More to the point, you have to sometimes force it down people's throats. Please use data. You, know, you have all these numbers that your company is saying, where does it come from? Can somebody please tell me where this number of 40% of the people on their site do this comes from? Usually, it's somebody who's imagined it. So we have to get them using the data. So not only do you not have sole control over your data, you have to make people use it. It has a flip side. You don't necessarily have sole control over the data in your company, but you are responsible for that data. If you lose your astrophysics data, someone will frown. They'll not be happy. Maybe you get scooped. If I lose the personal identifiable information from my company, oh, I get fired. And they get sued for millions. So it's this weird situation where you don't actually have control over your data, but you have to protect it as much as possible from outside the company. It's a difficult place to be. Um, it's delicate, um, but it's definitely an interesting place to be. Actually, dealing with pers people's personal credit information is terrifying. I don't want it. I have to be able to use it, but I don't want it. So, and to be fair, this one again is probably throughout all data. If you leave that laptop on the train, like the government have done, it will hit the news. And the last bad message is you're going to have to switch between projects. I had one project in academia. I worked on that day in, day out. That was my work. You work on it so you have a paper. You then probably do another paper based on that work. I work on multiple things at the same time. I will work on stuff that somebody else has done and move it forward and then they take it over. You don't have the luxury of working on one project. I know people in small and large companies do have that luxury. Yeah, that is what that startup is doing right now. You're working on that. In a big company, my friend is told, this is her project. She's on that for the next six months. I'm working on recommender systems. I'm working on how to actually score rare products. 10,000 pound necklace, plastic pigeon. How exactly does one rate those? Somebody who wants a plastic pigeon doesn't necessarily want a 10,000 pound necklace. How do we show them that so they don't have to hunt through 100,000 products? Who are our partners? What are they doing? All of these things I can work on for an hour a day. And they all have to be done. I can't prioritize one or the other because I'm told they all have to be done. And there's only two of us in the data science team. So if the other data scientist goes on holiday, yeah, I need to pick up his work. 
If I tell you anything, comment, please comment code. It, it will save your life, or it'll certainly save mine if I'm working with you. Because you have to pick up projects that other people have been working on. You don't have the luxury of having that sole product, and it can be frustrating. In academia, you have that paper. Your name is on that paper. You present at a conference, and everybody knows that, that is your work. Somebody picks up my work and finishes it, they present it. It's their work, they've finished it, even if I started it. But equally, if I pick up their work and I finish it, then I present it. So it's difficult. You have to work more as a team, where I found in academia, you often, you're looking out for you. You want your name on that paper. So I've probably zipped through that a lot quicker than I thought, but I really would like discussion as to what people think. Um, if you're not willing to tell me now, my email address is there. Also, if you are interested in a career at Not on the High Street, many varied challenges, great place to work. Um, come and speak to me or send a contact to the careers at Not on the High Street. Thank you very much. Or comments. So why, why, why did you leave academia? Partly it was a lifestyle. Um, I didn't want to work weekends anymore. I didn't want to work evenings anymore. And I wanted to settle down in one country. Oh. So I've been moving all across the world. You settle somewhere, you get settled, you buy a sofa, you sell the sofa, you move with two boxes. So for me, it was more of a, a lifestyle choice. Um, and I found it's worked. I don't work, well, she says work in a weekend. I don't work weekends. I don't work evenings. Um, I get to go home on a night. Doesn't say I won't necessarily do that if I get incited on a project, but I don't have to. And I get to choose the city that I live in and still do the really fun, cool stuff like machine learning and such. So. So more of an observation. You were talking about SMEs. Yep. And, uh, um, from what I've learned, most SMEs are basically fairly static in size. There's a small number of SMEs which are very important to the economy because they're very fast growing and have the potential to fast growing. Yep. And possibly more interesting to work for. Yes, definitely so. Not necessarily. No, it depends on the company. Um, for example, mine is looking at expanding. So within the next year, they will break that SME barrier and move forward. They also want to go international. Those are the companies that can, as you said, can be very exciting because the opportunities can expand rapidly. Um, yeah, but it, it can be a static field. It depends on the company, it really does. So I moved to an SME and then I moved back into academia. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so Interesting. I really, really miss science. Um, so, do, but do you not find that you do actually have to manage lots of projects? They're just sort of different things in SME. Like, um, my academic, not really, but that's only my experience. So I had to manage like my outreach work and like one project. Okay. And that was a big project. With, I guess it had multiple elements to it, but the main thing was one large project. Whereas here, I can be managing like six different projects all on the go at the same time with the same deadline, and they all have to be done at that same point. Um, and within academia, I was often dealing with the same people for that same different pro that same project. Whereas here, I'm dealing with multiple people from different fields, so each one feels very isolated and very different. Um, yeah. <laughs> making the transition because I found it very difficult to convince people that I could program professionally having got a PhD on the basis of my programming skills. <laughs> You'd think it would be easy, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, it can be. Uh, my company is in some ways a very soft company. It's not a full tech company. Um, you know, we have people with marketing, we have people who just take photos, who have never heard of an algorithm. You know, I'm asked what is data science multiple times and I hate answering the question because I still don't know how to. Um, so actually then you say, okay, I've got a, a degree in astrophysics. More likely they're going to step back and say, oh dude, just no, I can't talk to you, you're too smart. It's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm fine, it's okay. Um, because they don't understand. I think maybe <coughs> if you go to a full tech company, it's a, it is that different. So mine is more convincing people that I can talk to you as a human being. Um, I'm not an android and a robot, despite what you think. And you know, 
what I do is important, and here's how you can use this data, and it will improve their lives. So I've been doing a lot of company outreach to try and convince people that data is great, data is fun. Yeah, li I literally fed them cocktails while teaching them SQL, and it works because it's something soft that they can enjoy, but they're still actually learning without learning. So I think maybe my experience was different because it was that almost you have to push harder for anyone to just understand data, not to push harder because I want them to believe me. So I guess I got, I got really lucky. My company is great. So <laughs> and if anybody does have any comments or such, I've pulled a very small people for this. Yes, we're based in Richmond. Oh. Richmond. Oh. So kind of south west, um, beautiful area right on the river. Yeah, it's a gorgeous building with loads of great people. So it's not central London. Um, so if you do live in the southwest, it's literally perfect. You can just, you don't have to go into and out of London. But we do have a lot of people who commute because you can get the district line straight through to Richmond. So if anybody does have any comments, I've pulled a very small number of people and I would like to pull a lot more for this. I've got a, one question. Yes. You mentioned the stakeholders. Yes. And so what would be the major difference between dealing with the stakeholders in industry and let's say being with the stakeholder in international projects? Mostly in international projects, we're all on the same wavelength. We want this one product. Um, you know, we're, we're all interested in astrophysics in this one part of astrophysics. I find my stakeholders will come to me with a question that isn't necessarily defined properly. I found in astrophysics they knew how to phrase the question to start with. Whereas in my stakeholders, because they're coming from such a diverse background, will phrase it how they need to, but that might not match up with the data. So very similar as to what we've spoken about in the data kind, they might think it's a great idea and a great project, but feasibly it's not possible. Whereas in academia, they generally knew the data as well as you did when working with these said stakeholders. Also, when you give them the data back, in academia, you're generally on a reasonably similar level. You know where you're going, etc. So you can be more technical, you can go into more details, and you can have more discussions with them on a technical basis. Whereas my stakeholders, if I talk to them in technical terms, I've lost them within 10 seconds. So I have to somehow pass that data so that they can understand it while still getting from them what they really want. And also convincing them that I'm not going to give them the data to answer their question exactly how they want because that's not necessarily what the data says. In astrophysics, I find that was not an issue. They want to see what the data says and then draw their conclusion. Some of them, some of them did want to change the data. I found that's a lot more prevalent with my stakeholders now. They have an idea as to what the data should say, and it's much more of a it's more of a communication issue. I think you have to communicate on a different level and explain data in a lot more more detailed, but less detailed, which is kind of that awkward level. So more insight, but less. Yes, definitely more insights. Um, a lot of the problem is trying to get the insights from them as well as to actually, you know, they want to know. Okay, what is a loyal customer? Define loyal. Somebody who buys with us. Define how often? Lots. No. <laughs> and so actually figuring out what they want, that getting that insight from them and actually giving that insight back takes a lot more work to try and figure out where each of you are coming from. Astrophysics, you'll tend to come from the same area, so I didn't find it as much of a problem. Yeah. Um, so it's randomly curious, having been on both sides of the coin, academia and SME, if academia offered you kind of stability that you sought working in the, I guess, the current mm. job, would you stay with academia? Not now. I probably would done at the time because it, it's scary changing. You're completely changing your life and everything, whole career. Now I love the, the challenges. In astrophysics, you get one problem. You deal with that problem for six months, a year, etc., and you produce that paper. Here, it's much more fast-paced. You have different problems. I'm literally trying to figure out how to define a customer journey, which sounds simple, but then you look at the data, and then somebody comes in and wants something else. So it's a lot more fast-paced. I find I'm actually, I feel like I'm giving a lot more back. I give one paper in academia, and I work six months to do so. Here, I'm at board meetings every week. I'm giving back the data. I actually feel like I'm accomplishing a lot more. It might be in smaller amounts, but to me, 
yeah, I wouldn't go back. Um, I find the excitement, the, the skills that I'm learning, um, I can pick up, you know, I spent two weeks and picked up MPL. In academia, you don't really get the chance to do that. You're focused in one area. If you pick up a new skill, it's for that and it is a long-term thing. Here, you can pick up, drop. It's very dynamic and very exciting and it means, you know, you don't get bored at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of it is also figuring out how you actually drive it properly. Yeah. <laughs> so it can be really difficult. You're trying to explain to them, look, okay, that's not possible. <coughs> how, what is a comp what is a loyal customer? Give us a definition. And you have to explain to them. So you have to literally almost force them out of the car, hijack it a little bit, and jump in the driver's seat. And it can be a battle. Mm. You're like, no, it won't. Yeah. Like, yeah. So to be honest, it depends if it's a CEO asking me or someone in customer services. <laughs> there are times you have to literally relinquish control. If it's a CEO or one of the execs, yes, sir, I am on it. Um, if it's someone else, then often I'll sit down with them and say, okay, why do you think this? Where is this coming from? Can I get anything out of them? And maybe they have an interesting question in their head. It's just not what they've asked me because they don't understand the relationship between the data and what they're doing. So I actually had some, uh, very similar to ask you, what street do they live on? It's like, why? So like, we want to know where our customers live. So I actually did um, a, spatial a spatial thing looking at actually where are loyal customers and I defined law myself because I couldn't get an answer and tried to show them, look, it doesn't really make a difference where they live. There's no difference. But for me, I enjoyed that because I got to learn new skills from it. So sometimes it is that balance. That I know the question is going to be useless, but ooh, I got some tech I can play with. And you take it to your own advantage a little bit. So, so coming on this one, so time management one. Mm -hmm. I do the Scotty method. Uh, multiply it by four. It's most likely to take twice as long as you expect, and then when you get it done, you seem like a miracle worker. So that's when you're going to, you end up at yeah. the number 16 now. Yeah. So what you're going to do next? So you then, say, yeah, yeah. Those situations, usually we talk as a whole team. Um, what we think is the option, we bring in the stakeholders so they can discuss their problem, they can discuss their problem, and as a group, we can decide, okay, actually, yeah, your problem is more important. Um, then it's a matter of, okay, we've got all of this work, we use um, an agile environment, so we have a backlog of work, we have two-week sprints, and we section out those two weeks. We also make sure, we try to make sure that what goes in those two weeks is what we do. Nothing else comes in, nothing else goes out, unless it's absolutely urgent. So we section off that time and plan ahead. Um, we try not to deal with, unless it's going to take less than an hour, we don't deal with little things coming in saying, look, I need this now. If you needed it now, you should have asked us a while ago. We do take into account, um, as April 5th, we said we had an audit. All of a sudden, uh, look, finance is going to get all our attention because that's what's necessary. So it can be, um, can be very difficult. Um, usually, we try to make sure that not one person deals with that. We bring it in as a team, and then we bring the, so two sets of stakeholders are competing, we bring them in, and they can also talk to each other. So when we choose one or the other, they have an understanding of why we did that, what's involved, and we still try and do their project. Maybe one person from our team will give them a little bit of support and help, and try and work it that way. It's a communication and a compromise. Um, I found that I'm much more involved than some of my friends in bigger companies in that. So I'm learning those skills of the stakeholder management a lot more than I would in a, a much bigger company where I'm kind of protected from that. I'm on the front line. It's great. I don't always think it's great, but it is great. But, yeah. So another question. Uh, well, I also came from academia. <coughs> what I felt there was that like, you're on your own research, you have your machine, and when it's available, it's yours. Like, yeah. And now if I'm in a company and you're depending on other persons, they may be on holiday, they may be have a morning off, they may be 
Yeah. Exercise in frustration, isn't it? Yeah. But like also that means that I would always need two projects to work on. Yes. So that's always helpful when you've got multiple things to work on. Um, we try in our company to be pretty strict with, so we have, we work in an agile way, so we have our two week sprints and we actually contact the people who we're going to have dependencies on beginning of that sprint and say, are you going to be away at any point? So we have an idea as to what dependencies we have. Um, it's not an answer we've actually solved, question we've solved. Um, we will still suddenly realize, okay, we're reliant on this one person and they're not answering their emails and they're working from home. It's not going to work. In that case, it's usually it's their project we're working on. If we can't get access to them and that, I'm sorry, you know, we're working on your work. The only real problems we have are DevOps, but usually they work in the building, so we can go and say, hi, can you fix Redshift for us, please? Um, yeah, in academia, I did also find the same thing if I was asking from data from somebody. The difference being they're in Chicago and I'm here. In my building, they're generally upstairs um, or working from home, in which case they will be in the office at some point. So I can go and literally sit next to their desk and say, hello, give me the data, please. Whereas if I've got to fly to Chicago, it's not going to happen. Um, so it is different, but yeah, the, the frustrations are not solved. Definitely not solved. <laughs> Tag team. Uh, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I finished one, early. One thing I was I was wondering. Oh, wait, wait. wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited about to ask the question I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it was I was assuming like to imagine that you have to manage. Oh no, sorry. It, what you described as a uh, agile, the system already been in place before you get. Started, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So what your experience would suggest that you should quite have for the company you're selecting and a look at the culture of the company because you cannot change it once you get hired. Yeah, so company culture is definitely very important. Um, you have to fit properly or you're just going to rub it the wrong way. Um, I've, I personally really like the Agile method um, and I was really glad I used it in my SDS course and I was really glad when they continued. Um, in my company, actually, our complete Agile system broke down. Um, it before Christmas, we lost our Scrum Master and everything just collapsed. As a whole team, we were completing nothing because everybody was here, there and everywhere. So we actually changed our culture. We pulled together as a team and decided, okay, these are things that work for us. These are things that don't. So I think when picking a company, it's not only what they, they do, but if they're willing to change and adapt and work things out. So for example, um, a small company, I would suggest stand-ups even if they don't do it. Even if it's a, it might not be the stand-up saying, okay, can we meet for five minutes each morning and have a coffee and connect? So not pulling it in. So I find the ability to, the ability to be open to change is for me, was for me personally a very important point of culture. And sometimes there's no way to figure it out before you go. You go for an interview, um, you can talk to other people there, you can do things like glass, glass, glass door, but obviously you're getting just the negative views there, so you have to balance that out. But you always get extremist success. Hmm? You, you will not get extremist success. Exactly. Not exactly. So it's always somewhat biased. Um, the only way is to go and see them. Um, I've actually been interviewing recently, um, and one place I went to there four times because I couldn't connect with it. Um, and I turned the job down because I couldn't connect with it. And it was that comf the job seemed perfect, but there was something that just wasn't clicking for me. Um, and con culture is extremely important, probably more so than the job itself. You can change the job, you will not be able to change the culture. Um, but yeah, that's just my experience. Thank you very much for listening.